All right, 2024 Republican presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy, he called out the left last week for its racist rhetoric. It didn't go over too well over at Fake News CNN. Take a look at that tense interview. What I said is the Grand Wizards of the KKK would be proud of what they would hear her say, because there's nothing more racist than saying that your skin color predicts something no, about the you content didn't, you of didn't your just viewpoints say that, you or your You didn't just ideas. say they would be proud. You said these are the words of the modern Grand Wizards of the modern KKK. It is the same spirit. You're right about that, Dana. I think it is the same spirit to say that I can look at you and based on just your skin color, that I know something about the content of your character, that I know something about the content of the viewpoints you're allowed to express. For Ayanna Presley to tell okay, me that's, that because of my skin color, I can't express my views, that is wrong. It is divisive. That is it is a, driving hate that is in this a country. Debate. This is dividing okay, that our is country a debate. to a breaking point. We don't need any more black faces that don't want to stand up for the black community. Something to that effect is the comment he was uh, responding to. Meanwhile, after he went viral for performing the Eminem song, one an Eminem song on the campaign trail, Vivek has now been sent a cease and desist letter from rapper Eminem. I'm sure he's really scared. Anyway, NFL Hall of Fame running back O.J. Simpson appeared to endorse Vivek this weekend, saying the guy really would have a chance. Anyway, 2024 GOP candidate Vivek Ramaswamy joins us with reaction. How are you, sir? It's good to see you, Sean. How are you? Good. Uh, I think you've dealt with the issue of, of your battle with Congresswoman Presley a lot over the weekend. I don't think we need to rehash old, old ground. I want to go over some of the issues, though. You know, you said aid to Israel, our number one ally, only democracy in the region should end in 2028 uh, and that they should be integrated That's with false. their neighbors. I have an exact quote. You want me to read it? That's actually. Yeah, you, I can tell you the exact quote. What I said is it would be a mark of success if we ever got to a point in our relationship with Israel, if Israel never needed the United States as aid. And Sean, you know how politics is played. A lot of the other professional politicians who have been threatened by my rise have used that statement to say that I would cut off aid to Israel. That's not correct. I've been crystal do you, clear. But do you? The only condition under which. Do you yep. understand yep. the importance of the strategic alliance, the intelligence sharing yes. in an area of the world where we have a lot of enemies, which, by the way, boggles my mind that we look for uh, the lifeblood of our economy and the world's economy from that very same uh, region of the world. when We have more natural Absolutely. resources here, which you agree. But you do understand how important that would, alliance and, and, is and, Sean, and how important I wanna, the intelligence factor oh, is and how important it is with Iran, especially seeking nukes. I understand it, I think, more deeply than probably anybody in this race. I've traveled to Israel. I have business partners in Israel. The reality is this. By the end of my first term, our relationship with Israel will be stronger than it ever has been because I will treat it as a true friendship, not just a transactional relationship. And why did you say I that they should not have preferential Abraham? treatment? Why did you say that Israel should not have preferential not, treatment from us? That's a direct quote. Sean, I, I, I understand. No, those are direct quotes from headlines summarized by opposition research fed to the fake news media. The reality is, here's what I'm you saying. Say is, that, but Abraham you, Accords 2.0 is my top priority. Abraham Accords 2.0 is my top priority, which is to get Saudi Arabia, Oman, Qatar into that pact with Israel. And foremost, to have a partnership with Israel that does something really important for the U.S., which is to make sure that Iran never, ever, ever has nuclear capabilities. That's important to the United States. And the other thing I've said, Sean, is that Israel's our friend. Good friends learn from each other. I would love Israel's border policies in this country. I would love Israel's tough on crime policies and strong national identity in this country. I would love an iron dome like Israel has to defend itself against Hamas, which is a good thing for Israel. I want something like that here in the United States. So I don't read from the traditional GOP talking point binder that's handed to traditional candidates. That's true. That lends itself to being misquoted. But it's actually a much more authentic commitment to Israel on the substance than just checking off the talking point of saying that we stand with Israel. That's meaningless. I prefer substance, and that's exactly where I've gone in a lot of these long-form podcasts I've done. I know that most, if not most conservatives, unfortunately, we, I see Vladimir Putin as evil, a thug, a murderer, uh, and he's trying to fulfill his territorial ambitions. I do believe we're going to watch China at some point try to fulfill their territorial ambitions with, with Taiwan. In the case of Ukraine, you make a great point, though. I mean, 
uh, I, a sovereign country was invaded. This is first and foremost a European problem. They have not stepped up to the degree that was necessary to actually assist them and protect their continent. And Joe Biden throwing billions and billions of tax dollars, but yet putting handcuffs on the Ukrainians and their ability to fight the war, denying them uh, Poland MIGs early on, denying there's, there's not a real... There's only a situation where I see this becoming a quagmire because they want it to be a quagmire. Now, if you're going to if you're going to engage, if Europe wants to engage and defeat Putin, they've got to fight the war to win the war. They've got to have the tools to fight the war to win the war. The first responsibility should be Europe's. If the United States wants to help and aid them in their effort because they're targeting innocent men, women and civilians. At that point, the U.S., I think, is should be responsible for some help. But not the help that we've been giving, uh, which which basically comes with no responsibility or, or no plan to actually win the conflict. Well, there's there's also a further point, Sean, which is that if we had been energy independent in this country and had been an exporter of energy, Putin would have never felt he had the leverage to go after Ukraine. But there's a deeper strategic point now. No, we would which be, is selling, we are we'd be selling our Russia. Western European allies all of their energy needs and we'd be becoming an oil exactly. rich energy that's, rich country. And I've country. said that countless times, but yeah. that's one of the key lessons we have to learn is energy independence and energy security is national security. But now, Sean, there's also a deeper point, which is that I worry we are now driving Russia closer into China's arms. And They're the Russia-China alliance is the no. single greatest threat that we face. And that's what I really worry about. It's and already I think that there. If there's an it's Russia, China, and Iran. Well, a new exactly. axis of evil is formed. So the question is, I, I and think I want other weaken countries it. in the... And I want to weaken, weaken it, too. Um, and I'd love to see that happen. Yes. All right. So what specifically the issue of you and Taiwan until we have enough microchips in 2028? What is your policy if if China seeks to fulfill their territorial ambitions with Taiwan? So I'm the only presidential candidate in either party who has had the courage to say that I'm not going to embrace the one China policy, which is the posture of both political parties today that I'm not going to just adopt strategic ambiguity. We can't afford that. We need to be clear that we will defend Taiwan. That's different from strategic ambiguity now. We have to defend Taiwan until we achieve semiconductor independence, at which point we resume our current posture of strategic ambiguity, which is exactly what the U.S. adopts today. So, Sean, it's worth reminding people that right now the U.S.'s position is a one-China policy. Yeah. Let me ask you this. At what point, for example, if Russia wanted to put nuclear weapons uh, 90 miles south of our border in Cuba, we did have a Cuban missile crisis. What would your posture be there? In other words, if you're saying as long as Taiwan Dead provides against the it. semiconductor chips, uh, we'll help them. But after that, they're on their own. No, I, you, actually, Sean, and that's, again, how my position has been caricatured. I will remind you and everybody else I'm not, I'm, I'm, that right you, now the United States. Saying. I'm listening. They, No, it's not what I'm saying, because well, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you very simply. Right now, the United States' policy towards Taiwan is a one China policy. Donald Trump was derided. He was made fun of for daring to pick up a phone call from the Taiwanese president. The United States of America right now does not even recognize Taiwan as a nation. I view it differently. I am clear that we will defend Taiwan. I'm the only politician in either party that has the courage to say it. And then I would resume. Well, I would resume the current position of the United States after we've achieved semiconductor independence. So that's the hard truth, Sean, is nobody in either party has the courage to actually say Taiwan's even a nation. I do. And that's why we're going to defend. Afterwards, we'll resume our position of strategic ambiguity, which is the current status quo. I will remind you, Sean. So I think that that level of clarity would make Xi Jinping a fool to invade Taiwan before we have semiconductor independence. And it also helps Taiwan increase its own military spending as a percentage of GDP, which is dangerously low today. And I think that that's the way that I lead with American interests while avoiding World War Three, ensuring that we have true semiconductor independence in this country and deterring Chinese aggression. The one thing that you have nailed down perfectly, in my view, is the strategic 
benefit of energy dominance and that we could have we could have bankrupted yes. Putin as it relates to if we were producing enough energy for Western Europe. Uh, similarly, our other allies around the world. Uh, but, you know, going back to this uh, this idiotic policy of energy dependence, not only is it resulting in higher prices for everything every American buys every place they go and now higher prices again at the pump. Uh, it has this ripple effect that yes. impacts national security, economic security. And on that major point, which is if we did that, we'd be all better off. You're dead right. Uh, Vivek, good to see you. Thank you. Yes. And all right.